IPv6 addressing. I'm Professor Dwight Hughes for the Intech 103 course at Clark College. Hello class, it's time for some Intech 103 whiteboard work. We're going to cover how to convert hexadecimal into binary and binary into hexadecimal. This is a review of what we covered in week one of this course. By now, you're all used to converting from decimal to binary and binary back to decimal, and you've probably used a conversion table much like the one I've drawn here. What we haven't had to do in the past few weeks is work with hexadecimal. Now that we have to, we have to add back the bottom section of this conversion table. Now I can convert from decimal to binary to hex. It's helpful to remember the symbols involved in hexadecimal. So if we take a number like 155 and we want to convert that into hexadecimal, that would be a decimal number. This is just for practice. I would first need to convert it into binary. I'd have a 128, no 64, no 32, a 16, because 128 and 16 would give me 144. So it looks like I need about 11 more. Take an eight, there's my 11 more. Now that I have converted 155 in decimal into 10011011 in binary, I can look at each nibble. So each nibble, which is four binary ones and zeros, and each nibble represents a single hexadecimal symbol. So I use this lower converter as I'm converting down, which would be a one and an eight, which is nine, and a one, which is eight, and a two and a one, which is 11. And 11 is going to be a B. Let's take a look at doing hexadecimal into binary and back. For this, I'm going to pull up a nice professional one I've drawn out, better than my handwriting. So we're going to fill in a hexadecimal here. Ace, right? If you remember, A was 10, and so if we want to do A, we would need to put an 8, no 4, a 2 and no 1. See how we bought that out? We know that A equals 10 and we simply filled in an 8 and a 2 to get our 10 10. And we know that 10 10 is 10 in binary. C is 12. Right? To get 12 I'd need an 8 and a 4 and no two, and no one. See how easy this is? E is 14, so that would be an eight, and a four, and a two. Eight, 12, 14, and no one. I've now easily converted hexadecimal into binary. Let's begin by discussing the need for IPv6. For over 30 years, we've used the IPv4 addressing scheme to run the internet. We've finally run out of those addresses. There are no more. They're what's said to be in the wild. They're in use around the world, and that's how you and I are probably connecting to the internet today. But there's no more in reserve to give out to fuel the continued growth of the internet. For growth of the internet to continue, we have to start using IPv6 addresses. 
I do want you to realize that there won't be a grand switchover. There won't be a day where IPv4 is turned off and IPv6 dominates. It's going to be a slow conversion. You can continue forever to use IPv4 addresses and you can also use IPv6 addresses. They will coexist on the internet. We'll use both addressing schemes. The thinking is as new devices roll out, and this is true today, they are programmed to prefer IPv6 addresses. So when they are communicating with other devices, they will first attempt to communicate using IPv6. And devices in the near future, in about five years, may start to be IPv6 only and not even support IPv4. At that point in time, you'll find that IPv4 um, use will drop dramatically on the internet as you can no longer get everywhere. So that's in the future. Right now, they're both fully supported. All the work and learning that you've done to be good at with IPv4 will pay off because your career, at least in the next five years, will be heavily dependent on working with those IPv4 addresses. But IPv6 is clearly the future of the internet and our industry. I wanted to come up with an analogy so that you could get an idea of what we mean when we say 340 undecillion addresses. I mean, what's undecillion? How much bigger is that than 4.2 billion? I mean, 4.2 billion sounds like a lot. Let's do a comparison. If I could cram all 4.2 billion IPv4 addresses in a single screen pixel on your computer monitor, and by the way, your monitor has several thousand pixels by several thousand pixels squared uh, to make up the screen. One individual pixel is almost impossible to see with the human eye. You'd need a magnifying glass. If I were to take all the IPv4 addresses in existence and represent them as a single screen pixel, I would need a computer monitor 650 miles wide to put all the pixels on that I needed to represent IPv6 address space. So it's that much bigger. It's, it's staggeringly large. We won't be running out anytime soon. Let's take a look at it. How about some facts? IPv6 is a longer number. It's 128 bits long where IPv4 is 32 bits long. Again, at first you'd be like, what, it's four times longer, how can it be that big? Remember, if it was only one bit longer, it would be double the size of IPv4. So if we had gone from 32 to 33 bits, it would have doubled the size of IPv4. And if we went to 34 bits, it would have doubled again. Remember your binary math, it doubles each time. So it grows pretty quickly. So we've doubled and doubled and doubled and doubled at 96 times, so it is much larger. So that 128-bit binary number is represented in hexadecimal. We use 32 hexadecimal symbols to represent the IPv6 address. Remember, with IPv4, we use dotted decimal, so we use decimal numbers separated by dots. The dots represented eight bits, so it was an octet or eight bits, and we had four octets. With IPv6, we divide it into eight sections instead of four, and each section is 16 bits wide. We separate these sections with colons. We call the sections a hextet instead of octet. Oct means eight, and hex means 16. So we have eight 16-bit sections to an IPv6 address. Here's an example of a real IPv6 address here with its mask slash 64. We call that mask the prefix length. That's similar to the CIDR notation that you learned with IPv4 addressing. We have the prefix, or the bits on the left, and the interface ID, or the bits on the right. This is just a renaming of network bits and host bits. If you remember with IPv4, the bits on the left are the network bits, and the bits on the right are the host bits. With IPv6, we simply rename them as prefix and interface ID. And our prefix length tells us where the prefix ends, or another way to think of that, where the interface ID begins. It's just a look at that specific piece of information about the prefix length we'll be doing with subnetting in our lecture next week. And I want you to be aware it subnets the same way. We use the same tools and rules, and we use the uh, prefix length the same way we use the CIDR notation to define our subnets. 
Let's go into the anatomy of an IPv6 address. The first 48 bits, or three hex tets, are called the global routing prefix. These are the top level network that comes down from IANA and the RIRs and your tier one and tier two ISPs. Uh, they define the global routing prefix. That defines which ISP uh, you're using, which ISP they're using, which RIR they're using, and ultimately the uh, scope from IANA. So we have nothing really to do with these uh, bits. They never change, they're just assigned to us and we'll leave them be. The next hextet, or 16 bits, is the subnet ID bits and that allows us to subnet our network. So it is these bits that are um, used for the first level of subnetting. And the subnetting is usually done by the internet service provider and they would provide a separate subnet for each site or location of your company. So if you called up, you would be assigned a single global routing prefix for your entire company and then separate subnets for each physical location. The remaining bits, half of the address, are for the interface ID and those go on your printers and your phones and your PCs and your laptops and so forth. Now these will be the bits that we'll be borrowing from next week to do our subnetting. It works just like IPv4 where we just borrow from the host bits. Notice here the subnet ID is not borrowed from the host bits. It's its own distinct section that is predetermined to uh, allow ISPs to subnet for you when you get assigned your addresses. But we can certainly subnet a subnet like we learned with VLSM. And that's what we'll be doing next week. And this is the prefix link that we've looked at a couple times. It's an important indicator that tells us where the interface ID begins and the prefix ends. Let's talk about compression of IPv6 addresses. We don't want to write an address like this. Can you imagine typing this into computers and network devices? It's quite long. We can actually compress it down quite a bit. You're going to see that here on this slide. The first thing we can do is remove all the leading zeros. So within each hextet, remember a hextet is the space between the colons. So that 0ACE, we can remove the leftmost zero. That zero cab, we can take the zero off. There's three zeros and a one, we can take that off. There's four zeros, we can get rid of three of them. And you can see an example of that here. So that's one way we can compress an IPv6 address, but we can go further than that. We have another trick up our sleeves. We can also remove any single grouping of consecutive hex tets filled entirely with zeros. So I've got one consecutive grouping of that here. You can see there's two hex tets right about in the middle of this address that are zeros, and I can simply drop the zeros out and put a double colon in their place as you see in this example. This one's um, a bit tricky because if you have two sections of all zero hex tets that are discontinuous, say you have all zero hex tets near the left and another set of all zero hex tets near the right, you can only use the double colon trick with one of those sets. You can't use it both places. So it can only be used once within an IPv6 address. So the rule of thumb there is you would use it on the largest of the two, right? If one was three hex tets long, you would use it there instead of the one with one or two hex tets. Also, if they're equal length, you would just do the first you come to reading left to right, right? So the first one you came to, you would just uh, use the tool there. So now that we've compressed it and you see it fully compressed here, we need to inflate it. So inflation or expansion of IPv6 addresses is going to be necessary before we can subnet them. So although we typically compress them and use them in compressed format, and this is the way you'll see the computers will automatically compress them for you like this, they will um, do that. And now we will need to 
reinflate them or expand them back up. So we need to add back in those leading zeros that we took out. So remember there are always four hexadecimal symbols between each set of colons because that's 16 bits and a hexadecimal symbol is a nibble or four bits. So every hex symbol, so uh, the two, the zero, the zero, the one, the A, the C, the E, those are all four bits. So look at the A, C, E, that adds up to 12 bits, but I know there's supposed to be 16 between those colons. I would need to add a leading zero on the left, and you can see that done here. It's the reverse of what we did on the previous slide. You're going to have a worksheet where you practice both of these, both compression and expansion. We can also um, undo the double colon trick. And I see the double colon in the address. I can go ahead and add back in the all zero hex tets. The way I find out how many all zero hex tets need to be added back in is I know that the total number of hex tets is eight in an IPv6 address. You have eight hex tets. And I can simply count that I have one, two, three, four, five, six of them uh, here. I've got looks like four to the left of the double colon and two to the right. So I need two more. So I can go ahead and replace the double colon with two all zero hextets, as shown here, until the total length of the IPv6 address is eight hextets. Let's talk about the types of IPv6 addresses. We have unicast IPv6 addresses, and these are addresses that are defined as one-to-one -one communication from one device to one device. They're the same as we had with IPv4 had unicast. If you remember the class A, the class B, the class C, we don't have ABC classes, but we do have unicast addresses. So we do have unicast addresses that are used for one-to-one -one communications. We do have multicast addresses. Remember that IPv4 had a class D that was the multicast addresses. Again, we don't have classes with IPv6, but we do have a range of multicast addresses that allow one-to-many communication. And so they are assigned to a group of interfaces, and a message sent from one is received by the members of the group. So it's a one-to-many. Let's talk about an anycast. That's a new type that did not exist with IPv4. So this is brand new in IPv6. And what it really is, is a type of multicast. It's one to nearest. No, multicast is one to many. So if one member of a group of four sends a message with a multicast, the other three members hear it. With an anycast, you still have a group of interfaces. So you have a group of devices, say four devices assigned to an anycast. If one member sends a message, it is heard by the nearest member, not all members, but the nearest member of the group. So it's one to nearest. It's a, just a type of, uh, it's not a multicast, but it's similar to a multicast, if you will. It's more similar to a multicast than anything else. It's brand new, so it uh, doesn't replace anything. I do want to note that we have something missing here. That's right, IPv4 had a type of address called broadcast, which was a one to every. And it was pre-assigned to every device and interface, so if you send a message, everyone got a copy of it. That's been done away with. That was very inefficient, and uh, we found how to use multicast to accomplish the same things we used to do with broadcast. So wherever they use broadcast in IPv4, they no longer have that option with IPv6, so they instead use multicast to accomplish the same function. Let's talk about the IPv6 address scopes. Well, we have our types, unicast, multicast, anycast. We talked about those, and uh, those are up here just for reference. There are three scopes of unicast address. Your global scope is similar to an IPv4 public address. These are the addresses that you would assign to your PC or your phone or your printer, allowing it to communicate across the internet. You can tell a global IPv6 address because the first three bits are 001. So every global address everywhere in IPv6 shares the first three bits as 001. All global unicast IPv6 addresses are 001. 
you know, the, the other 125 bits can be other things, but the first leftmost three bits are always 0, zero 1. So if you write these in your notes, you'll have an easy way to determine on an exam, for instance, if you have to identify global unicast, you'll know that it always starts with 2000 with 0, zero 001. A link local is a local address and it's actually required. You don't have to have a public IPv4 address, but you have to have a link local. A link local address is always FE80. And I show that to you here in binary as well. Um, it's easier in this case to remember the hexadecimal FE80. So the FE80, any IPv6 address that begins FE80 is a link local. And those are addresses that can't leave the local link. They are used just to communicate to a device, a neighbor device that's connected directly to you. So those are uh, what a link local is used for, for very close in communications. You can also have a unique local, which is an FC00 address and FC00s um, are similar to the IPv4 private addresses. If you remember the private ranges, there was the 10 range and the 172.16 through 172.31 range, and you have the 192 range, you have 192.168. With unicast unique locals, we have a single range FC00. But realize, of course, you can subnet this, right? We're only defining the leftmost seven bits so you have 121 bits that you can subnet. So you can create as many unique local subnets as you need for your company. So you really have a lot more unique local addresses than you ever had with IPv4. All multicast addresses begin with FF00. So that's the way to identify if an IPv6 address is a multicast. It always begins FF00. Any cast, those you can't identify easily. They're derived from the unicast address space. So you can have a global anycast, a link local anycast, or a unique local anycast. So it would have the same three scopes, but it shares the same scopes. So it doesn't have any unique identifier. They're just assigned. So you just take a unicast address and assign it as this is going to be an anycast. Let's talk about some IPv6 specialty addresses. In IPv4, we had that quad zero address, 0.0.0.0. .0 Remember, that was the global network ID. That's the very first IPv4 address, right? The very last one was 255.255.255.255. If you remember, that last one was broadcast. Well, obviously, we don't have broadcast, so we don't have an equivalent to that. But for the first one, we still do have a default network ID. And in IPv6, it's colon, colon, slash, zero. So that colon, colon, remember, can represent any consecutive number of all zero hextets. So you have eight all zero hextets, or 128 zeros with a slash zero prefix length. Your loopback testing address in IPv4 was 127.0.0.1. With IPv6, it's colon colon one slash 128. So that in binary would be 127 zeros with a one and then a slash 128 mask on that. Let's talk about one more topic, EUI64. This is a cool new feature where you could set the network prefix and let the devices make up their own host address, right? Or what we call interface ID, right? So a host device could be programmed or learn the network prefix. And then for the remaining 64 bits, remember that that's why it's called the UI 64. There are by default 64 bits in the interface ID portion on the right half of the IPv6 address. We follow these three steps. We take the MAC address of the device, which is a burned in address that's always there on every device. And that's a unique 48 bit number that is used with ethernet technology. 
and we're going to just inflate it to 64 bits. So we take that 48 bit number and we flip the seventh bit and you see that here. If you take a look, we have a hexadecimal zero zero and if you were to lay that out, that's 16 zeros, right? That zero zero. And we are simply going to find the seventh bit in that and flip it. And so the seventh bit is going to get flipped. And then we are going to insert in the middle. So we split the sucker open right down the middle and squeeze in an FFFE. Okay. So you see that there. And then you have your final result. That's basically what we do. We just insert um, FFFE. We flip the seventh bit and we have our final result down here. Don't worry, the computer does this out of magically. So this process happens automatically. We just want you to know where these weird interface IDs come from. So these often, you will see these most with the FE80s because the computers will create their own FE80, which if you recall was the link local address, which I said was required on every device. So the device just goes ahead and makes up an FE80. So the network ID would be FE80, which is the prefix, and then the interface ID would be this long, awful thing.